Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Squarespace, the all in one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use offer code FRAMERATE12. The open road. Yeah! Oh, man. Just a hundred more miles. Whoa! A sweet little bunny that needs my help. Hi, buddy. Hey. It's me, Alan. Aw, you look so cute. Are you smiling? Ha, 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 ha. Can I pet that fur? Uh, Give cut him, him loose, cable. Cut him loose. Cut him loose. It's frame rate. Welcome to Frame Rate, episode one hundred fifty-two. The show that thinks you should be able to watch the stuff you want, when you want, where you want, whatever darn device you please. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, beautiful people. I'm Brian Brushwood. And uh, how about that amazing, very compelling argument for why people should keep cable? You ever we be kinda... out on a hundred mile bike ride, Tom, and then a glowing eyed bunny shows up and then you realize that you're missing two thirds of your organs and you think to yourself, oh, if only I had not cut the cord, if only I paid a hundred dollars a month to Time Warner, Comcast, Bright House and the rest of those jerks, then maybe everything would be fine. Yeah, wholesaga.com is what Brian's referring to. That's what we heard off the top of the show. It is the NCTA, the Cable Industry Association's uh, attempt to market cable. We played the one where if you cut him loose and he doesn't have cable anymore, he can't watch the CNN report about how to tame the mutant bunny. Um, okay. Two Tom, of the Tom. things on, there are four scenarios, Brian. Two of them end up with him using the internet, though, which is not what Somewhere. we mean when we say cord cutting. Somewhere out there, I mean, we, we need to address how astonishingly stupid this is because I guarantee you, and please give me a high five on Twitter if I'm right, someone out there is listening to audio only and says, no, wh what are you talking about? What? Nothing you have said this entire episode has made sense up until this point. So to dumb it down to the lowest common denominator, the cable company industry conglomerate, the secret corporation with all of them around their long table and a photo of the globe behind them with, you know, I don't know, like, 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 like a skeletal hands coming down over it, got together and said, what we need is a website to scare people into keeping cable. And someone stood up and said, hi, it's me from IT. I have an idea. How about a website that plays one of four ridiculous scenario videos in which people are so completely fundamentally idiotic, so unbelievably stupid that they put themselves in peril. And in each case, we claim that it's cable, that it's cable that can make things all right. However, for half of them, we won't even mention cable as people understand it as a way to get hundreds of channels at an affordable cost. For half of them, we'll just clearly refer to the internet. And then to which the old fat cat set down his 20-year-old scotch and said, yes, but will there be a call to action or an explanation of our motives? And the IT says, no, I just figured we'd show really weird stuff. <laughs> and make an embarrassment of ourselves. In, in a we'll way, I kind of respect that. Wholesaga.com. H-O-L-E-S-A-G-A.com is the stupidest position website I've ever seen in my entire life. It seems to imply that if you don't have cable, you can't have the internet. At least in two of the videos that are there. Um, right. Which all is sometimes true for people. That's the problem! Uh, but it also is not really true. I mean, you can you can have cable without the internet. Here we go. Look what happens. Here's what happens if you cut the cord. Look, if you, you cut the so cord. You are so cute with that soft fur and those deep red eyes. Are you smiling at me? Are you smiling? We can ride on my bike and we can hug 
And we can listen to music. Oh, hello. What are you doing, buddy? <laughs> hey. Oh. I thought we were friends. Oh, it's, wow. Okay. Because he wasn't watching cable. Like, okay, it was the CNN website. I couldn't tell. This, okay, this, this, like, uh, to be honest, I thought this was so terrible it had to be troll bait. The, the, the fact that this, this cable industry association, whatever it is, has like a generic ass swirl with the word cable underneath looked so ridiculous to me that I thought, no way someone is putting out a, a position ad this terrible and with a logo that generic and a message this awful. But apparently, I believe you, Tom, you're my go-to guy on this. Because, in fact, when you click on NCTA, I, gar- I dare you, try to make sense of this. Uh, do me a favor. Click on this, Jason. D- I- make any sense about this. News, social media, video chat, original programming. They're all brought to you by cable every day, everywhere, on just about any device. At NCTA, we're making our digital lives faster, richer, and more complete with features and technology that you can only get here. And that's why life without cable can leave a mighty big hole for us to fist. Oh, they don't say that about the fist. Do they? That's implied. That that's the, oh, that's, okay. that's the, uh, if, if you, if, yeah. uh, if you well, didn't skip sounds, English. Sounds like the NCTA to me, Brian. <laughs> I just, I've, never been, I've never been angrier at these guys in the entire history of the show. I feel like we got to stop me, stop me, move on to something else. All right. Well, I, I want to move on, but I don't have a fun thing to move on to, unfortunately, because it's the, uh, it's the news that I announced on Friday at Tech News Today uh, that Twit is not renewing my contract as of December 30th. Uh, now, right before they made the announcement, Leo very graciously offered uh, to let me continue on frame rate anyway, even though they weren't le- renewing the contract, and I, I declined. Uh, so we will not be doing frame rate after next week. Next week, Brian and I will do one last show of frame rate, uh, but that's it for us. But we're not done together. Trust me on that. More, more to come later in the show. Let's move on to the big story. This just in, the big story. Tom, so Tom. Hey, Tom. Yes. Tom, someone in the chat room said, you know, if I'm not paying $70 a month for cable, that's a mighty big hole in my budget that I get to fill with There's whatever I want. in my wallet that I really don't want there because... <laughs> because all my money left. <laughs> uh, there's a great article by Tim Wu up on the New Republic today, which I actually just gave, I like scheduled time. It's long, folks. If you really want to, skip down to near the end because a lot of it covers ground. If you're a longtime frame rate listener or, or viewer, you already know. It goes through the history of the rise of Netflix and all of that sort of thing. But there's three bits out of it I want to pull out uh, for us to kick around here, Brian. One is Tim Wu posits that the new networks, talking about Netflix and Amazon in this case, uh, compete based on their ability to make the right original programming decisions that secure the best old shows, as well as the prescience of their recommendation engines. This is after a long explanation of how the current television networks make their decisions on based on what can gather the largest mass audience. And he says, if modern American popular culture was built on a central pillar of mainstream entertainment, flanked by smaller subcultures, what stands to replace it is a very different infrastructure comprising islands of fandom because we don't all watch Seinfeld anymore, right? On Netflix, you can choose whatever you want and Netflix will even recommend different programs based on who you are. CBS, ABC, NBC, they don't do that right now. Finally, he says the whole idea of forging one people, in other words, like all of us are part of a mass culture and we all share the same loves and hates of television shows, Forging One People is not entirely benevolent and has always been at odds with the country, meant to be the home of the free. He's arguing basically that this mass culture we've been experiencing for the past 50, 60 years is unusual and actually against what the United States of America was, which is we don't care what your culture is. Come and enjoy yourself and do your own thing. We don't have a national identity. It's high stuff. 
not only 100% agree with that, but I would take it even a step farther. For those who hearken back to the days of why can't it be like the old days when we all liked MASH, when we all liked Cheers, and no matter who someone was, we could talk about those hijinks of Sam and Diane from last week on Thursday. And of course, the time they're talking about are the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, when crime was far higher than it is right now at a time when your distribution channels were so narrow and and are, are so wide that you define yourself and your choice is so few that you define yourself not by what you liked but what you hated when you had the rise of the punk rock music when you when when people said you know what i love is hating the crap that corporate chills are trying to feed us we live in a delightful wonderful world that, yes, feels a little bit more tribal and that I can't explain to my grandparents anything about Reddit. But that's OK, because my other friends in the Reddit world know what I'm talking about. Um, the world is delightful and wonderful because we get closer to Dunbar's number. This is what uh, for those of you who don't know, Dunbar's number is the maximum number of other entities you can perceive as as people in your mind beyond about 150 it becomes very difficult and you start to think of there's you your friends and the other you know whatever they are and then you come up with a with a with a description and in fact uh, if, if you want to get highfalutin about it and this is what you've inspired me to do tom is that's isn't that what the diamond age is all about is in a oh, yeah. world where everybody can have anything they want Nobody got together and all did the same thing. Instead, they splintered off into vastly different cultures where everyone could live in their own bubble. You had people who wanted to live with morals and values of the Victorian era. You had people who, you know, wanted to, to uh, you, you, you could take any time and place in history and essentially live that and make that your culture. And we're getting close to that. And you know what? It's great. The reason we know it's great is because crime is down. People are reporting unprecedented level of, of happiness. We're making more money uh, as, a, as a society in general. We have more leisure time than at any point in history. We're living longer than at any point in history. And part of that is because we are attracted to programming that we want to move towards, not shovelware thrown in our face at some fat corporate hotshot in in Los Angeles decides because he played golf with someone at NBC back in 1982. Yeah, Wu's Wu's last paragraph had me feeling like patriotic, frankly. He's like, certainly a culture where niche supplants mass hews closer to the original vision of the Americas, of a new continent, truly open to whatever diverse and eccentric groups showed up. The United States was once almost by definition a place without a dominant national identity. As it revolutionizes television, Netflix is merely helping to return us to that past. USA, USA. Anyway. I mean, okay, so so did I just veer like way into crazy talk land or did anything I say resonate with you, Tom? No, absolutely. I, I, I don't have anything to add because I agree with you that that, that is, is what's going on. And that, I think, is guiding this revolution that we're seeing uh, with, with Netflix and online video and people choosing. I, I think it has more repercussions than just what we talk about with video, frankly. I think it's affecting publishing. It's definitely affecting music. Wu goes into that in this article about how we don't have as much of a mass music culture anymore as we used to. And it really shows that what they're trying to defend when they say we really need to preserve this business model is the old order. And the old order isn't even the order that's predominated through most of human history. It's just a recent uh, recent thing. So, yeah, I I definitely resonated. God, I, it, I, I, do you realize, Tom, that I went as far as I could to the extent of my beliefs in the crazy direction so that there would be something you would disagree with? And now it's like I, I'm like, look at me out here on the limb. What's up, Tom? And you're like, oh, oh, hey, hey, I'm, I'm almost there, Brian. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, is there room over <laughs> here on the limb? Yeah. No, no I'm like, just because, happy on the edge I of the limb. I honestly don't think it's that crazy. I, 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 seriously, it's not. Uh, it is. Well, you, it, it would have sounded the, the, crazy. In fact, when the Diamond Age came out, it sounded crazy. It's science fiction. Yeah, the uh, the biggest, most counterintuitive part to me is the idea that uh, that by uh, having less common ground, we can get along better or or have. I, I don't know, a bigger cultural or more interaction or whatever. I mean, it's like, I, I, I don't know. It's like, I feel like a hundred years from now, uh, 
political borders will mean virtually nothing. And people will identify themselves, again, back like the Diamond Age. And it's the Diamond Age by Neil Stevenson, if you haven't read it. Uh, there'll be a time where it doesn't matter where your meat is. It's where your heart is. And that's kind of, God, that sounds so poetic and stupid. Uh, for, forget everything. Let's just go on to another big story. It is another big story. Too. Stop everything. It's another big story. I thought it was poetic and awesome. Thank you, personally. Uh, but we've got uh, numbers. Needham and Company's Laura Martin uh, has a study out about what would happen if we unbundled cable. Now, it's a study in a vacuum. It doesn't ask, it doesn't ask the question of knock-on effects. Like, if we did unbundle cable, would Netflix and Amazon you know, get more subscribers? It doesn't do anything of that. It just says, what would happen to cable in a vacuum? She estimates that $45 billion of TV advertising would be at risk under such a change, along with 1.4 million jobs, $20 billion in taxes paid by cable operators, uh, and $117 billion in market capitalization because about 56 channels would survive uh, and 124 channels would disappear. That would happen, she argues, and, and very reasonably, uh, because we know that people would probably subscribe to between 10 and 20 channels. And all of the money that's coming in to pay to get these channels right now is because you have to get them. If you don't have to get them anymore, a bunch of channels won't get enough people to support them and they'll be dropped. And when they're dropped, that's money that goes away. So the thinking behind this, if, if you are a cable industry executive and you point out that it's like, look, yes, you pay one big fat all you can eat buffet but out of this, we're able to create this giant laboratory where we have hundreds of different channels, thousands and thousands of hours of programming, and people can take risks. And it doesn't matter if not a lot of people want to watch the food on fire while being ground upon by a sexy mime network. Then, uh, but, but at least someone out there, who knows, the next big hit might come from that. Um, but the problem, of course, is we don't see the next big hits coming from those. We do see occasional moves of of desperation like AMC taking big risks and and as we've talked about on the show making long shot programming that's exquisitely targeted and turns out to be a mass a mass hit but what we do see all of this happening I, the the problem is is that you can get all of these benefits from internet television we're already starting to see that happen the quality of programming that we're getting from YouTube environment, from the Vimeo environment and then of course from Netflix and Hulu and 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 those networks is better and better and better. And all of a sudden, that argument for we need a whole bunch of money to create a diarrhea of crappy vomit all over your face uh, in the hopes that there'll be one chunk that turns out to be really good is, is a bad argument. And it's going away and it's dying. And that's great. Um, but, but in the meantime, it does mean that you are going to see a breakdown. Uh, to be honest, I think this whole people want a la carte thing is a red herring. It's disingenuous. If I'm the cable company, that's all I'm going to talk about is how people want a la carte. And I'm not going to argue against Netflix. I'm not going to argue against Hulu. I'm not going to argue against um, over-the-top networks. I'm going to argue against a la carte uh, unbundling because that's the one thing where the numbers, yes, do not work. And I'm no longer in favor I am not in favor of a la carte. Uh, we've talked about this in the past, but I'll, I'll flat out say that a la carte will screw you in, in the end. I just can't get rid of diarrhea on my face. As a well, it's, it's actually, it's a diarrhea of vomit. The diarrhea was metaphorical. Right. The vomit was literal. Uh, yeah, my reaction to this article was like, oh, so if we did a la carte and let the marketplace actually decide, most of these channels couldn't couldn't survive. So they are being supported inefficiently and unnaturally by a system that doesn't work. Hmm, that makes sense. Uh, I don't care if that survives or not. That sounds like a horrible system and a system where people can choose what they want to watch, when they want to watch it, and where they want to watch it <laughs> sounds much better to me. I will support that system. And that's the system that is taking shape on the internet, right? I mean, what she leaves out, and I'm not criticizing Laura Martin. This is a typical study where you're like, look, I have to define the parameters somewhere. And I'm just looking for an answer to this question. And here's the answer. She's not, she's not a shill. She's just saying, here's, here's what would happen within this industry. But the, the broader implications are that, sure, they would lose that money and those jobs would go away. And that's a bad thing, uh, especially for the people with those jobs. But 
that money is going to go somewhere else. It's not going to just disappear. It's not going to be like, well, we'll never spend that money. No one will ever buy anything else anymore. Uh, what will happen is that money will be spent somewhere else and that money goes into the system. Even more so, they say, well, we would lose these niche programs. And that's a loss to, you know, maybe not that many people are excited about the farm network, but it's really a, so, it really important for farmers and they get lots of great information there. The thing is, See, and here's, here's as long problem, as we have Tom. internet access, which is this whole separate issue, but as long as we have internet access, the farmers can get so much better information than they can from that one channel, which is inefficient and too expensive to run. We've already seen, Tom, much beloved programs that got shafted by networks and went on to have a very successful life being totally independent on the internet. This sure, look is at something Arrested that programs can do. Yes, yeah. but just because a show gets canned by a network does not mean it's the end of it. The people that you love on that show are not going to be gone forever. They're going to be available and they're going to be doing things that you love. They're going to be making you laugh and entertaining you. You'll just have to show a little effort to go to the new place. And then once everybody's there, it won't matter anymore. So don't support a la carte cable, for goodness sake, people. It'll right. just encourage them. Um, those people, though, that you're talking about, Brian, they're going to need a website. Squarespace.com. All in one platform makes it easy. Create your own professional website or online portfolio. Constantly improving the platform. Beautiful designs. More than 20 new beautiful temps for you, uh, templates for you to start with. And all with style options you need to create a unique website for you or your business. It's incredibly easy to use. I use it. Probably going to be using it more. If you want some help, go to Squarespace. They have an amazing support team. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Customer support team has won numerous industry awards, and it's mobile ready. So like with my book site, uh, if you look at it on a phone, you're going to see the book images followed by the description, right, in a pillar style. But if you go to a tablet, you see the book image to the left with the description to the right. And then if you go to the, the web, the desktop, you're going to see like the full layout, the way it's meant for the desktop. It's, it's, it just does it automatically. It does it to make it look good for you. Even their code's beautiful. Search engine optimized and hosting included. They take care of the hosting, so you don't have to mess with that. Start a free two-week trial with no credit card required. Start building your website. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code FRAMERATE12 to get 10% off and to show your support for FRAMERATE. We thank Squarespace for their support of FRAMERATE. Squarespace, everything you need to create an exceptional website. Shall we slipstream now? Man, that's that's the first time, Tom, that I've heard you use uh, slipstream as a verb. Let's just see. Yeah, oh, hey, did Brad, I verb it on. for the first you time? Is that... Yeah. You want, come on. Come on. Let's uh, slipstream. Slipstream me. Just, it ain't weird. Let's so, slipstream yeah, dude, I was this. Slip streaming. Let's just, just Yeah, say, I used to be slipstreaming slip back in the 70s, man. Everybody was back then. David Bowie uh, used to slipstream. It's good yeah. enough for him. Good enough for me. Damn right. I love his song, <laughs> Laughing Gnome. Hey, uh, Time Warner Cable incoming chief executive Rob Marcus... Uh, said this week, trying to figure out where he said it, uh, but he said that the company will add another platform to the list that can access the Time Warner Cable TV app, which enables subscribers to stream live channels and watch videos on demand. Of course, everybody's like, is it Apple? Is it Apple TV? Are you going to be on the Apple TV? Because we think you're going to be on the Apple TV. The Time Warner Cable app and the Apple TV would be great. What is that? He didn't say. You know what? Here's, I, you may not like what I'm about to suggest, Tom. I but we've okay, I'll wait for you to say it. we've we've been following the rumors, and of course, all of this is rumors, right? But at some point, you gotta you gotta make certain suppositions, you gotta read between lines, and so on. We've followed the idea of the Apple TV for a very long time, but we've talked about like, well, why is there one? If there is intelligent life out in the universe, why is it not here? Is what we've been asking, um, and. Uh, uh, we made excuses about how well the licensing deals are more difficult and complicated. We made the fact we made parallels with the fact that the music industry was in much more dire straits than Apple uh, or than, than the television is right now. When Their Apple was able to come nothing. in and dictate terms before, but they're not able now. Um, I honestly believe, Tom, and I hate to say this, I honestly believe that most likely the result of all of the Apple TV rumors we're going to see is some kind of partnership that will be much heralded. It'll be Apple essentially giving up, just as Intel is selling off that division, Intel essentially is admitting defeat to the, to the rumors and just sold it off to a cable company. I think that Apple is going to not admit defeat, but instead 
partner boldly on a bold new vision that will be a highly compromised version because what we project onto the Apple TV project is what you want when you want on whatever device you want, or at least the one device in the living room. Uh, I I feel like if it was going to happen, it would have happened by now. I don't think it's going to happen with the major media partners. Oh, see, here's I think what I think. See an I, here's, if it turns out to be true that Apple TV is getting the Time Warner cable app, I don't think it's going to be any different than what's on the Roku or the Xbox 360. There's going to be an app that shows up on the main screen that's there right now. It's a little chiclet. It says Time Warner Cable on it. And if you're a Time Warner Cable subscriber already, you pay for the service already, you'll be able to log into it and watch live streaming TV. And that's it. And it will, yeah, it'll be touted as, as significant because it's a cable company partnering with Apple. And everybody's going to make all kinds of hay about that. And they probably should. But it's really not going to be any different than what we already have, except it's on an Apple device. That's it. Yeah. It's not going to be, it's going to not going to bring new functionality. Which, it's not going to mean anything other than, hey, that thing you can already do on the Roku with your Time Warner cable subscription, you can now do it on another device. It's uh, kind of jumping ahead of feedback. One of the things that didn't make it into feedback this week was somebody said, uh, I don't understand why Brian said that we'll all be stuck with cable, uh, uh, which I didn't mean to say that if that's what I said. What I meant to say is I don't think we'll be stuck with cable, but I guarantee you, Whatever it is, those same guys are going to get that 80 bucks a month from us somehow. I think ah, that they'll package yeah. it. They'll bundle it. We'll be all excited about the new features and, you know, whatever ecosystem they've set up. But at the end of the day, they've built an empire on every person who can afford it, giving them $80 a month. And that's not going to go away. And that's why they're they're demonizing the bogeyman of a la carte cable and just long enough, I guarantee you, they don't even believe their own hype. They're just pushing it back long enough for them to introduce some fabulous new thing that uh, that will be closer, still not what we want. And as as Tom said, will probably be just giving us back the stuff we already have. So let's with move the to happier interface. news on the two okay. tops. The information which is not a reference to an old television show. It's a new website uh, that you have to pay to read their articles. So you'll have to find this elsewhere like we did at Engadget. Uh, but the information uh, has inside information that Google will be launching a Nexus branded set-top box device in 2014. Uh, it will be aggressively priced. So be careful looking at its price. Don't look it in the price. And it will be a gaming box uh, as well as having a, uh, a, a a TV hardware, a TV, you know, it'll have Hulu and Netflix is what I'm trying to say, along with gaming and video conferencing. So they'll be pitching it more as like, it's Roku meets Ooh Yeah. And you can do Skype call, or probably Hangouts. You can do Hangouts calls on it, do video conferencing. Uh, let's say this thing is $40 or $50. And it's a little box that plays Android games like Ooh Yeah, but it also has Hulu and Netflix. Uh, and it has a little bit of Google TV-ness, but it doesn't have any live TV on it. What are, what, is, is that enough of a differentiation for you, Brian, to make this stand out and be better than Google TV was? Well, my gut says mushy middle. Like the moment you say 40 or $50, that is not far enough away from the Chromecast. If you want to succeed, right, well, yeah. you, you got to have, you have to have one brand pegged at the high end, one at the low end. And considering that most Google TVs- But they're TVs, saying aggressively if, priced, so- Well, figures. and that's the problem, right? It's like- yeah. I mean, I would hope that what they mean by aggressive is aggressive to my wallet in that they're going to take $300 because it's just that good. But I no, suspect no, you're no. right. No, no, no. This is, is a budget. They're another... describing a budget device for sure. I mean, uh, uh, Ouya only cost you what? 99 I think? Yeah. No, and that's the problem. And and, and Ouya, you know, it's, uh, the, the reason I haven't bought it is because I perceive it as an underpowered, uh, essentially a phone that hooks up to your, to your, uh, your television. Um, but the key marketing pitch here is going to be like, Sure, you can watch your Netflix and Hulu stuff, but you can also play Angry Birds and Candy Crush and, you know, maybe which, some sword which fighting I games. Al which I already, look, I'm I'm playing all of those right now while I'm talking to you. This is, I don't understand. It's, I, I think this is a bad move if that's the case because it offers absolutely no benefit. First of all, it gives an indication that Google TV is dead, which of course they don't want to put out. If they've developed that brand a lot. They put a lot of effort in there by by saying that we have the new hotness coming out. It's called Next, Nexus. You're essentially saying, eh, forget about Google TV. Uh, second of all, the device has to be vastly different in price from the Chromecast. Chromecast 
did everything right. It was one thing exquisitely well. It was cheap and novel. And people, somebody pointed out that the Chromecast cost less than the case for this iPhone. I made a joke about getting an iPhone case. Someone says, yeah, or you could have a Chromecast instead. That's exactly how you want people thinking. You're thinking cheap does one thing well. If you're going to move, if you're going to try to cover two ends of the spectrum, then move that other end way the heck up. Give me a $150 mega premium thing that, yeah, that, that blows that. my mind. They, they did that with the uh, the Logitech review and the other Google TV boxes from Sony and such. Charge me uh, more, make it, it better. I think, you're, I think you're a little crazy there because I don't think anyone ever complained about something being equivalently less priced. And so the Chromecast... And and the Nexus TV aren't the ones that are people are going to compare. They're going to look at the Roku, the Ooh Yeah, and the Apple TV. And so if if Google comes in at a price of sixty or seventy dollars for this thing, or even fifty bucks, I think people. I don't think anybody's going to complain that the Chromecast is thirty five and this is fifty. If anything, they'll complain that the Chromecast is thirty five and say that should be cheaper. If you're going to do that, 50. then call it the. If you're going to do that, then call it the Chromecast Plus. And and still position it as the cheap thing, but the cheap thing that can also play Angry Birds because we loved it in two thousand nine. And honestly, Google doesn't care as long as as long as they're selling more units, even if it cannibalizes Chromecast sales a little. That's that's yeah. fine. Um, well, let's do some film found. We got new releases. A, a couple of Netflix shows to tell you about with different release schedules. So starting December twenty fourth, uh, Netflix's first original series for kids, Turbo Fast will be released, but it will only be five of the episodes. In other words, not the entire season at once. What Netflix is saying is, we have five episodes done. It's an animated series. They take a long time to do. So we're just going to, instead of artificially holding them back until everything else is done, we're just going to put them up. Enjoy them. Five episodes. Kids watch things over and over and over again anyway. And then eventually later this year, we'll add some more episodes to that. Now, do you? here's the question. Do you believe them? Do you, do you think this, because part of me says... Even if they did have all of them done, which, yes, it, it does take a long time to animate stuff, and I don't doubt them on that regard. But hypothetically, picture a world in which they had all 12. Knowing, now keep in mind, part of Netflix's strengths is that they cater to the actual viewing habits, not the stated viewing habits, but what people actually do. That's the reason they bucked convention and, and went released entire seasons at a time. Those same guys looking at the way television is viewed by children, I could conceivably say, we run the math models, they will, if we release it all at once, it will be seen a total of 280,000 times. If we break them into five episode bundles, the sum total by the game theory is it will end up being seen 470,000 times. You know, that, I, 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 is this tinfoil foil hat territory or you just take them at their word? No, I think it's the second half of the conversation. Is, is what I think. I think, uh, you know, Joe Producer comes in from DreamWorks Animation and says, uh, yeah, I know we had the schedule. Uh, we wanted to release in April. We're not going to make it. It's going to be delayed until late 2014. And Netflix says, ah, she, we really need this out here. He's like, well, we got five episodes done. Uh, you know, if we were on a normal week by week release schedule, we could actually start releasing them earlier. But, you know, and somebody at Netflix goes, hold on a minute. Let me talk to Bob in data mining. And then Bob has the conversation you just had. Like, well, yeah. actually, you will get 470,000 streams if you, and they're like, great, we'll take those five episodes, get us the next batch whenever you can. Uh, we're going to run with it this way and see what happens. Because, you know, Netflix is in experimental mode anyway. So they're probably like, let's try it. Well, because all of this also goes back to the the ongoing debate between Justin Robert Young and and me about, uh, you know, Justin Robert Young's theory two years ago was that Netflix was crazy to release entire seasons at once. He thought that you would get more traction, more conversation, more water cooler talk if you released them in clusters. And now, and, and he recanted that. He said he was wrong about it with the rest of development <laughs> and he was wrong about it with, with House of Cards. But uh, now we're actually seeing a little, as scientists would call it, Tom, a natural experiment happening yeah. right now. And it would be interesting I if think only so. Netflix would actually give us any numbers. Then we could actually find out how it did. It would be interesting to get those numbers, I know. We, we reporters... Would love to have those numbers. I don't think it's a mistake for Netflix to hold them back, really. I don't, you know, it's it's not like they really lose anything there. Um, yeah, I I think this is also because it's kids programming. 
a, a different way of a different a thing they have to look at differently. And a lot of people speculated, wait a minute, is this Netflix changing binge watching? But House of Cards has got a release date, February 14th, 2014. Mark your calendars for season two of House of Cards. They're releasing all those at once. That will not be an experiment in changing the release model. They're like, that worked for us for House of Cards season one. We're going to do the same thing for House of Cards season two. Oh, so I so can't wait. I started rewatching old Valentine's House of Cards. Day. Yes. That, for this Valentine's, how about a story of politics and betrayal? <laughs> you, me, a box of chocolates. And House of Cards season two. <laughs> All right. Are we ready for some scan lines? <laughs> no, no, I'm not. Don't you want it? Please don't make me. It's it, okay. Is it already happening? Are we are we having scan lines now? No. No, actually, apparently we're not. <laughs> we're not. Okay, start the scan lines. Uh, Netflix is almost as popular as cable among young adults. Uh, this is a story on Mashable, and the chart uh, comes from. I have a thing over my, the, the logo. It's Statista, a statistics portal. Uh, but it shows that cable TV, 63% of American adults subscribe to cable TV. 25% uh, of American adults over 68 uh, subscribe to satellite TV. Very few of them subscribe to Hulu Plus, Netflix, and Amazon. And it, it's a little similar for 49 to 67 years old. It's a little similar for 37 to 48. And then it reverses for 18 to 36. 43% of them subscribe to Netflix, 46% to cable TV. Netflix almost caught cable TV in this. Okay, now what's great is that you look at this and you're like, yeah, uh, uh, screw those old guys. Netflix is awesome. But remember that you don't have any money and Netflix is, is almost an order of magnitude cheaper than the others. I'm going to use an extension. I don't think I ever have before. Uh, and the Whoa. reason I want to use an extension on this is I think this is trend setting. You've, you've I never think this needed is, to use this an is, extension before until this now. Is dangerous. I put in extensions in the beard. Actually, I don't know if you know. <laughs> uh, this is this is pattern setting, right? Before it was like I don't have enough money for cable, but someday I'll get cable and I'll be able to watch stuff. Now it's I don't have enough money for cable, but I do have eight bucks for Netflix, and now I'm going to watch yep. Netflix. Maybe I don't need cable ever in the world, especially if I do Hulu and Amazon Prime. Like, it's harder to win those people back once they do start making more money and settle down and have a family because they're, they're already locked in like, these are the things I watch right here. Well, and I'll tell you, I've watched it uh, firsthand with the kids. Now, now, I will say that the side effect is that the kids, you know, they're accustomed to Netflix for everything. Uh, the kids on their own discovered the Amazon Prime app works on the uh, Xbox and they've started streaming stuff on Amazon Prime. But but meanwhile, they are reaching the end of their Netflix rope. So Netflix needs more programming for kids. Maybe five episodes of Turbo. Uh, Netflix's Daredevil TV show will be led by Cabin in the Woods director Drew Goddard. You know that I loved capital L-O-V-E-D, Cabin in the Woods. You know I'm a fan of Joss Whedon. Uh, we, of course, have already said that we're fans of what they're doing with their bold, ambitious four different series of Marvel characters on uh, Netflix. How does this make you feel? Uh, do you have a good, warm, warmy glow from Cabin in the Woods? I do. I liked Cabin in the Woods. Plus, this is a guy who is becoming the heir to both J.J. Abrams, because he worked on Cloverfield and Alias, and Joss Whedon because of Cabin in the Woods. Uh, so he's got a good pedigree going on. He's a comic book fan. I want to see what he does with Daredevil. I think it's good that they're starting with Daredevil. You know, the movie was different. Uh, and, you know, I did not like it. A lot of people did like it. I think I'm much more excited about what this TV series is going to do. Good call. Netflix getting top quality talent to do these things. I think Well, and it did a good job of shaking up convention. Yeah. Plex for Chromecast may be coming. There's some hints in the latest uh, Plex server file. Somebody noticed this on Reddit. Uh, there is a Chromecast XML file, which means that the Chrome or that the Plex devs are at least toying around with some kind of compatibility for the Chromecast, which would allow you to use an app to send anything on your Plex server to your Chromecast and then to your TV. Now, uh, for those who don't remember or get mixed up because they host a show about cord cutting and there's a lot of services, which one is Plex again? Plex is the uh, is is the one that you install, uh, and then it's it's a media management uh, sort of situation. Uh, they have some cloud storage options as well, um, That's, and they wait, already wait. support Dial, which is the streaming for Chromecast. Is is Plex the one where you can actually upload your DVDs and then have other people 
access them? Well, DVDs are content protected, Brian. So no, uh, that would be violating the DMCA. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, if well, you're, oh, you mean your home uh, DVDs? Then yes. Yes. Okay. Got it. Uh, hey, man. You going to France anytime soon? Because guess what? You'll soon be able to watch Netflix, uh, online video company Netflix, meeting with the French president's staff on Tuesday to discuss a possible launch of its streaming service. This is one of those stories that's almost, it's a non-story. It's like, get ready for the domino. This is, if we were, you know, it's good that we're reporting on this because it means that Netflix and and the the ethos that it embodies is spreading throughout the world. And finally, we'll get, now all those <laughs> French angry fans that we have will not hammer us about talking about Netflix because it's not available in their country. But um, but but pretty soon it's going to be every country. I mean, right? That's what well, we're on track for, aren't we? I'd be interested to see if Netflix can do this because under the current rules, a film cannot appear on an on-demand video service that is bought as a monthly subscription until three years after it debuts in cinemas in France. Oof. That's a well, long that. time. Netflix is talking to the government because they want to get them to change that. The TNT Network is teasing Mob City, their new television show, by tweeting out first the first episode script line by line. Uh, they're doing it starting uh, uh, today through Wednesday. And, of course, at 9 p.m. Eastern time is when the episode premieres on the TNT Network. Uh, so you get a little tease. They're adapting it. It's not just the lines directly from the script. They've kind of edited it. They're putting uh, still frames in to kind of illustrate it as they go along. And they said they will stop right before the conclusion to encourage you to actually watch the episode to find how, how it all ends. This is actually way more awesome. I'm going to tell you in advance, I'm going to use an extension. So let me talk for a long time here, Jason. This reminds me of one of my all-time favorite projects that I ever saw on Twitter. If you go and look up a Twitter handle at the Drake Smith and look at his lists, you'll see a public list called Project Mayhem. And what this guy's done is a, it used to be one line per minute done real time. Now I believe due to API calls, he's got to change it. But if you look, it is the entire movie of Fight Club played out between 11 Twitter accounts uh, from, from Di Tyler Durden, Jax Dalbuck, or Jax Bile Duct. Uh, to, you got Marla as a character, you got Space Monkeys as a character, and they're tweeting at each other all of the elements. They go through the entire movie uh, and it's astonishing. I, I left it in my feed from time to time just to have those characters like talking to each other. Um, I, I think it's a good idea for them to try something so novel. It's really awesome. Again, it's at the D Drake Smith and look at his lists. It's called Project Dash Mayhem. I think that violates the first rule, Brian. Uh, of, 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 of cord cutting? Of fight club. <laughs> hey, you want a witch drama? Yeah, maybe. Uh, maybe. Depends. Uh, Genji Cohan, uh, who has got a lot of goodwill because of Orange is the New Black, uh, plans to take viewers back 300 years to colonial New England. This series will be on HBO, but it will be about the Salem witch trials. And don't forget that uh, she's, you know, Cohen is also known for the series Weeds. Uh, so this would be Weeds, Orange is the New Black, and unnamed Salem witch project in her repertoire. I think this is an astonishingly good genre for her to dive into. I think that Genji Cohen has shown a reliable track record for making interesting, quirky female characters who feel trapped and who wish that they could be honest, but instead find themselves in webs of, of lies and deception and trapped by, by their own position in life. And I cannot think of a better period in history than this. I, I love The Crucible. I think this is a fascinating idea, and I, I personally can't wait. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, too, especially if, like, The Crucible, it's a metaphor. Made it for the end. Nice. All right, time to check in on the winter moon. Then. Because Justin Robert Young is kind of starting to run away with it. Uh, the, the movies that were, the movie that was out this past week was Out of the Furnace. It was Justin's movie. He only made $5 million on it, but he has got $442 million to Casey's $375 million to Father Robert's $327 million, and the rest of us are way far behind. Yeah, man. Is that the end of it? Now, keep in mind, Justin is so confident. Now, keep in mind, Justin's head is very swelled because he realized 
that he has pretty much won this without with only one movie. And that's why he's already loudly proclaiming that we need to break up Star Wars because I, Justin Robert Young, have cracked the code on all movies that you just buy one really good movie in the winter draft for right? whatever price. Um, it, how much of an anomaly is this? Do you think that that two years from now, Star Wars is going to be as big or even bigger as Justin insists? I think it will be as big. I, I have differences of opinion about whether it should be broken up ahead of the draft, which is what we were talking about last week. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's going to be crazy big just because all of us old timey people will want to go see it in the theater. And it will just it'll have that buzz that snowballs. Uh, don't forget, this week is the Christmas movie weekend release. So we get four movies coming into the draft. American Hustle, which is my movie. Saving Mr. Banks, uh, which is uh, the movie about the creation of Mary Poppins. That's Casey's movie. Tyler Perry's A Medea Christmas, also my movie. And The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smaug, uh, which is Jeff Kanata's movie. Jeff Kanata is in fourth place with $132 million, So he's distantly behind. But if The Hobbit outdoes what it did last year... It could propel him into the top spot. Even if it does what it did last year, it would get him up definitely in the top three, possibly number two. So the question is, does he have any chance of being catapulted up there? Because uh, his other movie is 47 Ronin, which comes out Christmas Day. Uh, the Hobbit, just, uh, uh, Brian, do you think The Hobbit is going to make more than $300 million? I ain't going to say whether I think it will. I'll say I hope it will so it can slap that smug smirk right off of Justin's face, if only for 20 minutes before he ends up winning the whole thing. Yeah. I I don't know if it's going to. I think it's going to make more than the first one, honestly, but, but probably not that much more because the, the early reviews are starting to trickle in and they're not they're not raving. They're not saying, oh, it's forget, forget last year. Everything's different. They're like, well, it's still a little long. Um. Mm. So I'm not not terribly hopeful. Although the trailers do make it look a lot better, uh, so I'm and I, I I enjoyed the first one. I liked it. it. I wasn't what I wanted it to be. It wasn't perfect. I wasn't raving either, but I liked it. So I'm going to watch this one. Tell you what, though, I mean, if there's one thing that could take a blah franchise and make it a little bit better, dragons, nothing but dragons, dragon, Dragon Tron 2013, that might help. Yeah, Smaug, as he says it. Let's uh, talk about what we're watching. watching i'll be honest not much this past weekend but i did uh i did check in on haven and arrow those are the the two shows that uh i i was able to i've been keeping up on because i really enjoy it whoa, 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 whoa. not not watching tv huh like not much tv not much movies not going out not just taking it easy huh not not this past weekend not as much no uh Weird, haven right. still a hundred percent the best most underrated television on television um it's not the best but they keep surprising me with their twists and turns the dialogue in this last episode was very cliche very and, and that's unusual for them but the story was great and i love what they're doing with the mystery it's getting to be very stephen king there's a door brian that opens to another world whoa i'm whoa. just saying what is, this is some joe hill stuff right here what mm-hmm mm there might, I'm not saying there's any dark towers or anything yet, but just just pointing that out to you. Uh, it's based uh, on a Stephen King novel, for those who don't know. Arrow got very CW this week. Uh, the backstory, the flashback <laughs> story is good. Uh, still, I like I like the mystery and the hosen and them trying to find the, 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 the thing that turns you into a super soldier and everything. And we got a little hint towards Flash. The Flash is going to show up uh, soon. But a lot of it was, you know, but who likes who? And we're at a society spectacle. And I, do I look good in my dress? I love you. Um, it, was a little, it gets a little heavy on that sometimes. Right on. I went and saw, uh, first of all, I started watching a couple episodes of Community. Uh, and weirdly enough, the vehicle that caused it to happen was the fact that uh, Zach uh, Holder is crashing with us for a while. And he left his, he does watch Hulu a lot. And I just never bothered. Uh, I never think to go to Hulu.com. But he left it open on my uh, computer. So I was like, community. Everyone tells me I got to watch. So I watched the first couple of those. Oh, and cool. I don't know if it's a victim of it just being 
you know, late the night I started watching or if it mm -hmm. just having those first couple of episode warm ups -ness. But it didn't it didn't, you know, punch me in the crotch immediately with with joy. Um, but it, but I'm going to keep on going through it. Like now it's another thing that I'm going to plow through. We also took the kids day before yesterday to go see Frozen, which I had hear, heard uh, like right now it's got like 88 percent positive reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, the uh, technology behind the animation is extraordinary. If you look, there's a, a SIGGRAPH demo of the way they modeled snow. The word is that Kristen Bell does an amazing job. The the, the dance numbers, the singing and all that stuff are amazing. Uh, and I was astonished how many things it got exactly right. Um, uh, uh, Whiteface Jerry Lewis, they got Jerry Lewis being a snowman. Um, they uh, They did so many things right, and yet it was as if, what if we had a movie and forgot to put a conflict in? It was just like there was so not a conflict. Like the reason for everything was uh, because reasons, and I, I, I think I hated it, Tom. Wow. I think I was bored wow. out of my mind. I was not expecting you to say that. I mean, I could tell I you, I, weren't, you weren't really hot on it, but you hated it. I think I hated it. I think I hated it because there was no second layer. You can make a kid's movie. You could put all of the trappings that make for a good kid's movie. You could put action set pieces. You could put songs. And you can also bother to have anything interesting to say. And Frozen had absolutely nothing interesting to say. The parents at the beginning made a fundamentally bad idea. They were bad parents. And it doesn't matter that they went off and died. Uh, the... People working at the castle continued bad decisions. There was bad communication skills and bad misunderstandings. And it was, they, 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 they were all just dumb. I, th I think I hated it. Uh, right. For example, uh, take, take The Incredibles. The Incredibles had all the, the, the color, the action, the sequences, the, 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 the visual razzle-dazzle. Uh, it was amazing. And also, it was a movie that was not about superheroes. It was about marital fidelity and entering your 40s. And it was extraordinary. And it touched me in a deep way. And I'm talking about when I saw it in my 20s. Like, I could tell it was talking over my head. You could have you worked harder, Disney. And I, and, I, and I didn't like it. There's that. I'm not going to see it, Ben. <laughs> okay. I wasn't really good to see it anyway, but now I'm I'm not even regretting not seeing it. Let's okay. fire up some feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. Fushigi in the chat says, ah, oh, the razzle dazzle of white face Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> It's a mashup of all the stupid stuff that comes out of my mouth. Uh, hey, man, look, a bunch of people are asking us, like, uh, hey, what's up with frame rate? You guys, you guys still doing frame rate? You doing frame rate? Blah, 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 blah. Hey, man, all I'm going to say, and let me be very, very clear about this. If you like frame rate, we want to know who you are and what you like about frame rate. So do us a favor. Go to tinyurl.com slash love frame rate. You will find a four-question survey. The first question is basically give us your email address. The next one is who's more awesome, Brian, Tom, or Tom's beard? Uh, and a couple other questions and a little place for you to tell us what you like about the show. Um, we'd really appreciate it if you let us know who you are and what you like about it. Because Brian and I are going to do something, but even we don't know what it is yet. So help us out with that. Appreciate that. TinyWorld.com uh, slash love frame rate. L-O-V-E, not L-U-V, right? L-O-V-E, sir. Okay. Love from Marante. Uh, Ozzy. Is this Leo's dog writing in? It's really eloquent. Yes, it is. No, I, I, I'm sorry, Ozzy. I didn't mean to compare you to a dog accidentally. Um, my name is Ozzy, and I just wanted to throw in my two cents. I consider myself a cord cutter. I pay for internet and get free basic cable like I as. I love that. Uh, it is my belief that the TV over the internet and a la carte TV channels is a dream. And many companies like Intel will try and fail because content is so expensive. But a company like Microsoft could, in theory, create an optional set-top box with a cable card, hard drive, and six tuners connected to the Xbox and let the Xbox One manage the content via the guide and allow other systems like the 360 to stream the content as well as iPads, Roku, and Android apps. TiVo has a similar service, but the equipment is very expensive and you still have to pay for guide subscription on every TV you connect. I say stop trying to revolutionize TV or disrupt the system. Don't waste millions securing content deals. People must pay can get it free or close to nothing when they pay for broadband. 
don't know if he's advocating piracy. It kind of sounds like he is. I have an Xbox One and several 360s as well as a TiVo DVR, which I need because of my wife, who is the only one that watches live TV in our home. My three kids rarely turn on a TV and must be content in my, and most content in my home is consumed by iPads, Apple TVs, Roku, and Google TVs with the help of Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon Prime. Wow. Uh, this scenario is true for most people. And the biggest hurdle any company must overcome is making the system wife-proof, not the content. Or husband-proof. Depends on the couple, right? Uh, but yeah, sometimes that's the thing. Is like you're ready to just cut the cord and go full on streaming. And the other person's like, oh, but I like this show on the cable that they don't have online yet legally. By, by the way, Tom, I thought it was interesting when you said that they can get it for free or close to free or close to nothing when they pay for broadband. I took that to mean it, oh. and maybe it wasn't even the way you intended. Like once you pay for the giant hose pipe of, of what did I say, either a diarrhea of vomit, you know, uh -huh. uh, once you pay for that, it's practically free for you to get all of that content on there. But uh, but I suppose oh, you're like right. The, he, he might have you know, been he might just mean Hulu or streaming online, on, you know, from from the network websites too. That's that's totally legal and free. Yeah. Well, uh, so so here's what I thought was interesting was uh, I I don't I don't think we've we've posted a letter from somebody who had an opinion that was so polar opposite from what you and I espouse. Um, what did you think when you read this? I'll let you well, go first. He's kind of a little bit all over the place, I have to say, in what he's saying. Yeah, Microsoft could make that. And if they could make it, they would make it because that's what they want the Xbox One to be. So they can't make it because they didn't make it is the way I feel about it. Right. That is, X, Xbox was supposed to have a cable card in, in it at one point. Uh, and they, they have deals to make the Xbox 360 work as a Comcast device. Uh, so I don't think it's as easy as he's making it sound by Comcast, by Microsoft, but that's kind of beside the point. I do like what he's saying about, like, quit trying to disrupt the system. Uh, the, the internet will take it over. You can just go start watching things on the internet. The only thing that holds that up is the thing he identifies. And it's not just your spouse. Uh, it's, 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 it's anybody who says, oh, but there's this one thing I don't want to give up. The fact of the matter is, if you'd never discovered that one thing, if you didn't know it existed, if they just said, like, would you watch, want to watch some things that are good? Here are some subscriptions of things that are good. Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime. And you all you need is an internet connection. Plenty of people would do it. They wouldn't care because they didn't have anything to lose in the first place. That's why we see young people subscribing to Netflix in almost as many in numbers as they subscribe to cable television. Yeah, uh, out of his entire letter, the one that really... really resonated me with me the one line was when he says it's my belief that tv over the internet and a la carte channels is a dream and many companies like intel will try and fail because content is so expensive and when i heard him say that that was amazing to me it was astonishing because in the entire history of humanity and I, or you know what in, in to the beginning of time as best we could tell there has never been more content more affordably priced now right uh, of course there is a bubble of mm -hmm. well-known heavily promoted content and in fact we've had people like steven spielberg and george lucas who have publicly announced this is a bubble and it's about to pop you're going to have some mega flops in the next couple of years and it's going to completely restructure you're not going to be able to get movies like battleship anymore and keep in mind you, you also have uh, people like kevin smith who says Stop saying these mega blockbusters movies are expensive. They're not expensive. What's expensive is the hundreds of millions of dollars they spend on 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 promoting the hell out of it. In a world where a movie can cost six million dollars to make and then and turn around and make fifty million dollars, but be deemed a failure because they spent sixty million dollars on advertising, uh, that's an insane upside down world. Um, so I honestly feel, especially, you know, and granted, obviously, Tom and I are here on an online network, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're obviously not making six million dollars per episode for doing this. But uh, it occurs to me that I think content is much, much, much cheaper than you give it credit for. It is currently highly overvalued. Yeah. And that's what that Needham Analyst uh, study does point out is that these networks are taking advantage of an inefficient system that gives you more money than maybe the market really would would give you otherwise. Uh, and that's how yeah. you're able to sustain some of this so-called expensive content because of that. Uh, 
Do you want to take the final email? Yeah, sure. This comes from James in the UK. He says, hi, Brian and Tom. Since watching your podcast, I've picked up on quite a few shows you've recommended over the last year. So I sincerely thank you for great entertainment like House of Cards, Archer, Orange is the New Black, Hemlock Grove, and The Astounding Justified. It helps that they're mostly on Netflix, of course. Please give me more recommendations, particularly if they're Netflixable. Maybe you guys uh, should have favorite shows list go along with your TV club idea or where frame rate followers can share and rate uh, shows. My type three, my top, my top three tips for you guys. Wow, that was harder for me to say than it should be. Almighty Johnson's Black Mirror and uh, Charlie Brooker's video games changed the world. The latter being an absolute must for gamers of the last millennium. And look out for Felicia Day. He gives us a link there, which I'm sure is region locked. If only we had a sponsor <laughs> that would let us get around that. Um, right. The uh, uh, I thought this would be a fun time for us to kind of do picks. And I would say you've heard me say it before. But uh, if you can, uh, I don't know where it's streaming right now, but uh, uh, Nickelodeon's Avatar The Last Airbender, shut up. Yes, it's for 12-year-olds. It's also is one of the most epic stories that I've I've watched the entire series three times and only twice with my kids. Um, I would also say, of course, The Shield, which we continue to talk about in Spoiler Zones. Um, and one weird one, if you have HBO Go, I don't know if they're showing it, go back and watch... Mr. Show. Somebody pointed out recently oh, that, that's a great one. That when the way people talked about Monty Python and you know the, the whole Monty Python series when when we were 12 is the way you know all the older brothers are now talking about uh, Mr. Show. Mr. Show is an artifact. It's all these people you'll be blown away. Uh, Paul F. Tompkins, you know, uh, Bob Odenkirk, uh, David Cross, Jack Black. I mean, it was the birth of Tenacious D and stuff. Uh, uh, get a hold of Mr. Show if you can. I totally agree with that. I hear people talking about Mr. Show all the time, more and more. It's it's definitely comes up more in conversation or online than I've ever seen it. I would add to that H+, Plus, the digital series on YouTube. Uh, if you didn't go watch that, especially now that it's all there. I think it's actually more fun to consume now than it was when you were waiting for it because it was because you could just small plow segments. right through it. Yeah, exactly. You can binge on it. And I think that I think that's a good one. Uh, I haven't watched the second episode, but Alpha House comes to mind. I really liked the pilot. I think it's a great show. I, uh, I, I think they had problems with the first episode, but I think it's worth pursuing. Uh, I, I, but one that I actually do did watch uh, all the way through is The Booth at the End on Hulu. Uh, and you can get it yeah, on Google for free. You don't have to pay before. for it. A great, great show uh, with a really interesting mystery. It's so simply shot, but still compelling. I, I loved it. Oh, people are also pointing out in the chat. I mentioned Mr. Show. Somebody else said also Flight of the Concords, uh, which I totally agree with. That's absolutely 100%. agree. Second thought. And as in well. fact, I used to be uh, uh, I used to be mad at Flight of the Concords for being too lazy to come out with a third season. Uh, and then one of them wrote the music and won an Oscar for writing the music for the Muppets. And then I'm like, okay, well then I guess right. you we're busy. They're not lazy. <laughs> Well, that is it for this episode of Framerate. Thank you, folks, for watching or listening. We will be back with one more episode next week. Uh, twit.tv slash FR. You can email us, framerate at twit.tv. And uh, we will be streaming live next week, 3.30 p.m. Pacific, 6.30 p.m. Eastern. We'll see you then. Mm -hmm.